Hey, everybody. Just going to give it a minute for people to pop on. Welcome. Thanks for joining me. Hello. Happy Tuesday, everyone. You guys know I always start with a sound check, so please let me know somebody that you can hear me. <laughs> I'd hate to talk to myself for the next 45 minutes. Hey, hey, Jill. Miss Jill, can you hear me, dear? Sounds good. Okay, very good. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you for letting me know. Good evening, everyone. I have so much good stuff to get into tonight, guys. I'm, I've am i been very much looking forward to this evening because we have some really important stories to talk about. Um, I'm bringing to you guys tonight for the first time um, Thanks for letting me know. Appreciate that, guys. Uh, we're going to be talking about Morgan uh, Bauer tonight, a very, very important story. I'm, I'm so grateful to um, be involved in Morgan's story. So we're, we're going to be talking about that. And then I will be getting back into sort of an update on all of the Warren Jeffs FLDS. You guys know there's so much stuff with that. It just it it's it's going to be a long process, but I am going to bring you guys up to speed. Uh, I posted a video this afternoon um, with him, with Warren Jeffs, actually speaking to 12 women, um, and it's quite quite horrifying when you put it into context with what he was doing to these women. So if you if you didn't get a chance today please go back uh, a couple posts and look for the FLDS post uh, that has Warren Jeffs live um, or audio of him, not live of him, but audio of him. So um, Lilia, uh, good question. I am going to be fairly soon doing a live with about nothing but Serenity Denard. It's been a while since I've done a Serenity uh, podcast. And I actually do have some information that I'm wanting to bring people up to speed on, but it's going to take a podcast of its own. It's going to take its own. So I will update you guys soon, but I never forget Serenity ever. She's always on the top of my mind. And I am uh, soon going to be doing just a Serenity update. Uh oh, okay. Okay. All right. I am think that people are getting hot on. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, Miss Bobby, I completely, totally agree. Makes you physically sick to listen to Warren Jeffs and the way that he talks to these women, knowing what he's preparing them for. Unbelievable. Just an absolute sicko. Um, I, for one, am glad that man is behind bars. He should always be there and never be anywhere else. Um, Next, guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be introducing you to a woman who is just absolutely inspires me, incredible woman. Uh, Sherry Keenan is Morgan Bauer's mother, and she is going to be talking, taking us through the story of Morgan. Uh, it's very important. Um, this Sherry has to tell a story, guys, that every mother hopes they never have to tell. This is every mother's worst nightmare that they would have to share the story. So I'm gonna start by first bringing up for everybody uh, a picture of Morgan. This is Morgan Bauer. Um, the reason that I got involved in this is uh, Morgan is a South Dakota girl. Um, she was living in Aberdeen, South Dakota. You guys know I'm a South Dakota girl too. Um, I try to focus on cases in the Midwest. Um, she had just left South Dakota. And so um, I think that's important to keep in mind is that she's in my mind, she's she's one of my own. She's a South Dakota girl. And uh, I, I really want her story to get out there. And there are some very unique and unusual situations with the story. So um, hello, Sherry. Hi, hello. Hi, thank you so much for joining me. So everyone, again, this is Sherry Keenan Morgan's mother um and as everyone can see last seen february 27 2016 disappeared from georgia um sherry could you just kind of uh take us through um a little bit about what led up to her disappearance just prior to it yes so um and so the february 27th date i don't i don't have know that one for sure so we the last date we know that anybody's seen morgan was on the 25th 
Um, she uh, is from Aberdeen. She left here. Um, she got a ride to the Minneapolis airport. She got on a flight there and she landed in Atlanta. She was there for 13 days. In that time, um, when she arrived, she was supposed to be staying with some people that she met on Craigslist to clean their house for them in exchange for staying with them. The next day, she spent one night, and we know that she went to dinner with them. She ate octopus. We think they probably took her someplace nice. And then from there, uh, the next day, she left uh, to, to go look for a job, we believe. And she, when she returned, they had put all of her things outside. So we don't know if she took all of her items from that house. We do know from there, she went and left, and we went to, to, to a gas station. What we believe happened from there was that she met a gentleman uh, named Courtney Ellis, is, is, is our belief, uh, who helped her get a hotel room in Lawrenceville, uh, Georgia, and possibly in Gainesville, and also helped her or set her up to begin dancing at top of Gainesville um, there. And she was dancing as a dancer at top of Gainesville. That's not what she was doing prior to leaving 13 days prior. She was uh, worked in catering. Okay. Um, from there, she applied uh, for a job at Club Tees, which is in Atlanta. Um, you have to have a permit to work in Atlanta. It not You don't in Gainesville, but you do in Atlanta. Um, what we know is that she was at Club Tees. She told a woman, Caitlin, We'll get to her in a second. That uh, she would help her get their permit the next okay. day. So Caitlin was another dancer at the same club, right? And so Correct. and right. And so Morgan left from there. She went to go dance. So I don't know if they were dancing together that evening, for sure. But I do know that they end up leaving together, and uh, from top of Gainesville that night. Morgan was with Caitlin Gable and her boyfriend at the time, Jonathan Alexander Warren. They left together. Um, they ended up in Porterdale. We know that that's where Morgan's phone last pinged going into uh, the 25th, going into the 26th. Then on uh, going into after midnight, Morgan was texting Courtney Ellis telling him that she needed to get to the other club right away because she'd only made, you know, a minimal amount of money. And so um, that was her plan. From there, what we know is the next day, the next morning, Courtney Ellis texts her over and over again, and Morgan never answers the phone. Okay. The now, Sherry, just to kind of get some context a little bit um, for Morgan, was Morgan a, a troubled young woman? Did she disappear often? I mean, was this something that you went, oh, Morgan's missing again, um, or was this out of the blue? No, uh, never. Morgan's never, you know, we're from, like, you know, you, we're from Aberdeen, South Dakota, so there's nowhere to go missing. <laughs> Too, okay. You know, you know, like, it's very small, and, you know, you know, we kept up to date with her. No, I think she was just looking to do, you know, to, to uh, try something new. Okay. So I've, I've read in some of the media, they've described her as a, a small town girl with big city dreams. So do you think that is why, I mean, it's like she leaves Aberdeen, South Dakota, this little town to go to Atlanta, the big city. So what do you think was the draw? Is it just the draw of the excitement, the big city, or do you think that there was a person there that was inviting her to come, but why Atlanta? Well, I think more than anything, you know, I think she wanted to, you know, like that live that star life, wanted to do some really amazing things. Like, don't we all, we're making a podcast right now, right? We all yeah. want the opportunity, you know, to shine our light. And I think she chose Atlanta because Georgia was a place making movies, but Morgan also likes men of color. And so I think that that was also a big draw for her, um, you know, to be in Atlanta, you know, it just seemed like a really, I don't know, amazing move for her. She thought the culture would maybe fit a little more with what she was into and who she was and things like that. Right. And so she was very, were you missing. speaking to her during those days? Was she telling you, mom, I'm here, mom, I'm there? Because you're sort of explaining it as if you're a third person telling the story. So were, have you heard this from people or she told you herself these events? No, um, most of all of the information that we know of for sure, uh, it came from Taryn. Um, more, uh, and then 
again from the couple, which we'll talk about soon. But no, Morgan was keeping in touch and she was on social media all the time. So she, again, not one to ever disappear, nothing like that. She okay. um, was always on social media, always connecting. Again, she wanted people to see her and know what was yeah. going on. Right. And so, so, she, so she's really posting started. selfies and posting videos and then all of a sudden it just stops. Yeah. Up until the day she went missing, she posted a uh, image of being at club tees and saying, and I work here. So up until that night she was posting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this couple that you talked about, um, that she sort of disappeared, uh, your understanding is it's the last people she was with. Is that correct? Yes, that we know for sure that 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 she was with. Yes. Okay, and that was Caitlin, and his name is Alexander. Correct. It's Jonathan Alexander Warren, but he goes by Alex. He goes by Alex. Okay. So, um, so I did a little bit of uh, poking around, and as I share this picture, people are going to say, "Really, that's the picture you picked." But I got to tell you guys, I I, I I didn't pick it. She picked it. So, um, you know, I think that it's important to keep in mind that this is going to kind of shock people a little bit to see um, a little bit about what she portrays herself on social media. This was um, what she had for her profile picture. <laughs> so um, this is the Caitlin that you're referring to, correct? Yes. Okay. And again, guys, I know the picture. I don't know if it's a Halloween out costume. I don't know what it is, but this is what showed up on her social media when I searched her for a profile picture uh, to find her. So um, I wanted everyone to take a look at these texts that were or, or posts that were made on her page. So we have Morgan disappearing around the 26th or 27th, correct? Right, the 25th, yeah, into that 26th. Okay, so and we have on Caitlin, who she was last with, according to you, your understanding, on February 25th, she shared a creepy stuff photo that said, this is Bob. Bob kills people for fun. Bob is one creepy mother effer. So these are these posts are incredibly unusual, as well as it is sort of a very strange picture. February 27th, um, her Facebook page says, I hate how some people don't understand that they can be hitting on someone else's boyfriend for emotional support. Leave us the blank alone and understand that just because I've been nice so far doesn't mean I won't get scary if you cross me. And then we have a couple weeks later, shared a post where she said, uh, death is when the party really started. And then she tagged the boyfriend who was also with Morgan at the end. Is that, am I, am I reading this right? Yeah. Okay. And his, his father's name is Robert also. So when you say okay. the Bob, you know, he's, and he's a physician. So um, just to kind of put another perspective and they're not, not including his father, but you know, is in the words may have meaning, you know, Bob, you know, I, I, I don't know. Okay. Just very unusual. So, so, so they were last with her. I'm assuming they've been questioned by the police. I'm assuming that this has been looked into and they have not been arrested. Nothing has happened. Um, so wh why has, have they been questioned, Sherry? So they were not questioned at first. Um, I believe she was briefly questioned on the phone a year or two later. He has never been questioned and their phones have never been searched because they say they don't have enough probable cause. Okay, so I will share him. This is his profile picture. Um, he was on here as Alexander Warren. So, um, so why was Morgan with them at the end? What was the purpose of them being together? To your understanding, they were friends. She, oh. you know, you. It's it's hard for people that aren't from South Dakota to maybe understand how trusting you are. You know when you leave and you think people are your friends and they care about you because they 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 pretend to be your you know you don't know what people's necessarily agendas are but she just why wouldn't she trust somebody you know i think that that's all it was so she her. she's basically new in a big town and she meets some people and she just immediately kind of becomes friends with them instantly because it's somebody that she can connect with, get rides with, stuff like that. 
yeah and they danced together and you know they okay. somehow connected or whatever and you know whatever that is and and you know and do we know if Morgan had any money or any financial resources? I mean, how did she have money to spend for herself to take care of herself? No. So when she left, she didn't have any money with her. The gentleman that gave her a ride to Minneapolis uh, gave her $20. She was waiting for approximately $615 to come on her um, on a H&R a Block card. And that is from um, an H&R Block card is... Uh, where you get your tax refund. So she was waiting for money to come on her tax refund. Okay. So she was essentially broke, just kind of getting by on a few bucks here and there. Yeah. She left with Un until that money came. Money. Right. Okay. So, so fill me in. So you hire a private investigator um, and this private investigator evidently made a name for himself through the Natalie Holloway case. Yes. T. Is this Ward. correct? Yes. Okay. TJ Ward. And so he's a big deal. He's very well respected, very well known. Is that my understanding within private investigators? That's the way he portrayed himself. Okay. So he comes along and says to you, Hey, I helped on the Natalie Holloway case. I've been, he's been on TV. He's been, you know, he's easy to Google and find. Um, so you, you trusted him that he was going to help you. Okay, and then how did that unfold? What did he find? Nothing. Um, I, I I actually have an invoice where I paid him two thousand dollars because you know it was at the beginning and I was coming up with whatever he had. And I gave him two thousand dollars. He still owes me four hundred and fifty dollars. I have the invoice. He didn't do anything, and 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 there is a, a itemized list of exactly what he did on that invoice, which was really nothing. Um, except he did go to the, uh, speak to um, the press and told to tell them that Morgan was fine. Okay. So that is she was hiding a from big her. thing. That is a very big thing to say, to go to the press and say, she's fine. I mean, that's, how did he know she's fine? Had he seen her? Had he made contact with her? No, he, from nothing. He just went and said that she was somebody that was arguing with her family from with no from nothing from and and i i i did i i'm not sure if i sent you that itemized list if i not i i can absolutely do that and post it on facebook as well wherever uh, so you could see the exact amount of of work that he did to go to, on public record to say that okay i would not think that a person would come out and make a statement like she's fine unless they know that she's fine, unless they've talked to her, sat down with her. I, I'm, I just am having a hard time understanding how someone could, could do that. Um, are you feeling the same way? Yes. I think he was just caught up in the trolls and all of the, what was going on at that time, the distraction from Morgan rather than actually finding Morgan. And, you know, you know, even if you get caught up in those things, you get emotional, you still have to do your job and you still have to, you know, and if you're, if you don't want to do your job, then don't, you know, but don't harm anything, you know, six years later, it's still very hard to get Morgan's case out there. Right. So when you say he got caught up in trolls, you had trolls, which I know a little bit about trolls. <laughs> yeah. Anyone online does. Um, there were trolls that were getting online and saying what about Morgan? that it was Morgan. They were her. Oh, that they were her. They were pretending they were her. Yeah. So what had happened was somebody went online pretending to be Morgan, saying that she was they were Sasha Atkins. And they were speaking to some of the girls, one girl who her name is Chelsea, who had never spoke to Morgan, didn't know Morgan, Taryn, and of course, Morgan's sister, Alyssa, and they were speaking to this troll. And of course, you get very caught up in things. Well, we've since proven that, it, you know, it couldn't be more that she couldn't answer. This person couldn't answer any questions that I asked them. But beyond that, just the typing was different. The way Morgan wrote things when she typed messages was different. You know, there's a lot of information about who Morgan was. If you go and research and a lot had come out at that point. Mm -hmm. And so it was just it was just a lot of misinformation. And then uh, my uh, Alyssa uh, had come out and said then at the time, you know, had Made some okay, and Sherry, Alyssa is who? Correct, yeah. Alyssa is, Alyssa is Morgan's sister? Yes, my oldest daughter. Okay, and she came out and said 
Say that again, please. She came out and she said that Morgan was fine, that Morgan was hiding from me and that I was stealing from the GoFundMe. Okay. Wow. Um, I'm guessing that that has caused some family issues. It sounds like it's been pretty complicated. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, you know, Alyssa and I had, have had struggles. You know, I didn't raise her. Her father did, you know, uh, it was just a very different situation, but, uh, you know, it, 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 it broke our relationship, you know, too. Mm -hmm. And so now, you know, there's two children that are missing. Yes. You, you've lost two, you've lost both your daughters. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what I'm understanding is you have a woman online that's faking that she's Morgan, which I do say to myself, what kind of a sick person gets on and portrays to be a missing person online to throw people off? I mean, that's unbelievable. Um, has that person been questioned or spoken to? Has that person even been identified, the troll, whoever they were? No, and we've had several things happen, including um, her um, Facebook page memorialized at one point, and we contacted Facebook to try to find out who it was, and they, they didn't, of course, respond. Um, they just put it back as a regular page. A couple of things were missing. So we know somebody got into her page. We just don't know who or how uh it's not as easy as you think just to ask facebook to you know if you if you can see how you can't even figure out how to get out of facebook jail you know you can't just ask them you know to turn something on or to change something it doesn't work that way and right. even with the police doing it it doesn't work that way you know just to get a warrant it, it's it's a it's a lot more in depth than you think and again that's, that's again so so strange do these things in any way sherry make you believe that um she is alive and maybe these people are correct she just doesn't want to talk to you she doesn't want to see you well i mean that's I, of course, have asked myself that question a million times, but let's, let's, the fact is this, we weren't speaking before she left Aberdeen. She left Aberdeen and went to Atlanta. We weren't speaking. Who would she need to hide from? She was there. She was there for 13 days and disappears. Tells her mm -hmm. best friend, it says she's working in a new club, tells her best friend she's going to see her. Now, even if she's angry with me, even if she doesn't want to speak to me, she doesn't have to. She's at that point, not speaking to me. Okay. And beyond mm -hmm. that, for six years that she would need to hide. I mean, for what purpose? I'm. I, I, what am I going to do? Right. You know? So, so Sherry, your theory. It sounds like you definitely would like to have um, the couple that I showed their pictures a minute ago. You would like them to be questioned just to make sure that all the stones are turned over and all the information is looked into. Um, what other things would you like the police to do? What else do you think they should be doing? Well, I think a couple of different things that they could do that could really help was one, investigate GBI into her case. Um, I can't bring uh, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation or the FBI into her case because I cannot prove that she's crossed state lines without her choice. So I can't bring them in on my own. It just doesn't work that way. Um, I've hired other private investigators and they just uh, don't have uh, anything that's come up either. Okay. At this point, um, yes, investigating these people, because even if, because something happened and they know something, they have, somebody knows something. And if you're, you, I just think it's important to do the, their due diligence. Mm -hmm. So is there a possibility, Sherry, that when she got there, um, she maybe met someone and that person could have recruited her into, let's say, like a sex trafficking, prostitution type situation. Do you think that that's one of the possible options of what's what's happened? And again, that's where Courtney Ellis would come in. And um, so a couple of different things can happen. So human trafficking, of course, is one of our beliefs and possibly that she's no longer with us, of course. Now, if, if she's been human trafficked, it can look very different ways. And so this is what it, people need to understand and we talked about this briefly is that it doesn't always look like somebody putting you in a white van and shipping you out of the country you know mm -hmm. it can very much look like uh, a gentleman that seems like he's your friend he's your knight in shining armor he's 
showering you with these gifts. He makes you feel so beautiful and amazing, all of the things that you've ever wanted. And then you start doing things that maybe you don't agree with. And then bad things start happening. And this is mm -hmm. happens to women every day in our relationships, right? Where we stay in relationships that maybe we shouldn't be in. So it's just the same kind of, and then you're doing more. And now you're prostituting, you're doing other things. You're ashamed of yourself. You're, you're being told that you're, no one will love you. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a, it can look very different ways. So why she may be choosing to be with this man, it could look very different ways. And a lot of women who are being trafficked may not even realize they're being trafficked. Some women, sure. didn't even, they don't even know. And until I see her face and she says, this is, I'm happy. And she's really happy. And that's, that's all, you know, it's all mm -hmm. it would take. Have there been any recent sightings or any new information that's come in, let's say in the last six months? No, Morgan is a cold but active case with the Atlanta Police Department. We have never had any verifiable proof of anything, any pictures of Morgan. Every piece of anything information we ever get gets sent to Atlanta Police Department immediately. Okay, so they've and never I even... I'm so sorry. I was You've never even it. sent you a picture and said, hey, here's a girl that we spotted that kind of looks like Morgan. Is this her? You've never had that happen or anything like that where you've thought maybe there's a chance. That happens all the time. And so when, oh. when people send me pictures, it's easy to tell immediately whether maybe it's Morgan or not. Tattoos. Morgan has several tattoos. Her ears were gay. So if somebody has just a regular piercing in her ears, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to hold that, you know. So there's just several of defining markers that Morgan has so that we can absolutely tell it's her. If we can see her arms, they have tattoos on her. Her chest has tattoos on them. You know, her wrists have tattoos. So in very distinguishable places, we can easily tell. And, you know, we have people who have bodies, different things like that, where we have to go through DNA over the mm -hmm. last six years where we've had to send dental records and things like that. So Morgan and and this is one thing as a tattooed mom, I will say tattoo your children because mm -hmm. it's a, an identifying mark because it's just something that can be picked out. And I am so grateful she has tattoos because it's just a big thing. I can look at pictures and say, you know, it just, it's not her because of earrings or, you know, yes. different, different things. So Sherry, I, I, I know this is kind of a tough question maybe to answer, but I do like to believe that mothers have some level of intuition. Do you have an intuition about Morgan and it, whether or not she's on this earth or the next earth? Do you have a feeling inside you one way or the other on what's happened? And I really appreciate that question. Um, I actually, um, part of my path is, is being a spiritual person and connecting in those ways. But I, I don't. And the reason is maybe I don't want to. I like the hope of whatever it looks like. And, and part of my spiritual journey is living in the mystery of, mm -hmm. of what it is. I'm not here to guess or, or make assumptions or, or do any of those things. Uh, my job is to trust that spirit has a plan for us and that, you know, her and I made a contractual agreement together in this lifetime and we're going to see it through. Absolutely. Well, I know that every person watching this, um, their heart breaks for you. Like I said, in my introduction, this is the, this is the story that no mother ever wants to have to tell. This is every mother's nightmare to not know the, the, where their child is, whether it be their son or their daughter, it's, it's, it's so painful. Um, I just appreciate you joining me, answering questions about your, your beautiful young daughter. Um, I just will continue to uh, cover her story, talk about her. I'm going to continue to ask some questions and see what I can find. I hope that I can be helpful in some way. Um, and I know that my uh, people that follow the page as well will share information about her and try to help in any way they can. So um, you're part of a team now. Um, this, we are a team. I sometimes refer to the women on this page because I'm, I'm about, I have about 88% female followers and I call us the mama bears oh my God. Um, because we really are like a group of mama bears in many ways. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining us and um we will I'm stay so sorry in touch. about that oh no problem so thank thank you sherry for joining us and uh i'll keep you updated and please keep me updated as well
Okay. All right, guys. Um, so thank you all for taking a few minutes to listen to the story of Morgan. Um, you guys can probably see um, a very sad situation. Um, Jill, you asked how old would she be? Uh, Morgan, let's see, that's a good question. Uh, she disappeared uh, in 2016 when she was 19 years old. So 25, I believe, um, is where Morgan would be now. So um, just a devastating thing. And, uh, you know, I made a post the other day talking about the fact that her lifestyle, yeah, there's people that can say, well, she was dancing at a club. She was 19. She just moved to Atlanta. She'd never lived in a big city. She was really kind of ripe for the picking in some ways. Um, and there probably was people or persons there that were found somebody vulnerable that they could prey on. And, uh, you know, every, every missing person is important. So uh, we don't judge the lifestyle. We just look for, uh, look for information. So please, everybody continue to share her posts. Um, and we'll continue to talk about Morgan, South Dakota girl. We got to get her back home so that her mom uh, can have some closure and some peace. Um, so, okay, guys. So next, I want to. Um, yes, Lilia, she she is still missing. She is still missing. No word of her mother said no new information as of late at all. So I'm going to be poking around. Um, I shared a little bit about the last people she was with. You know, they are, they have not been found guilty of anything. Uh, evidently, the police have not felt they had enough information to question them uh, at, at any type of a level uh, that's serious. So um, all we know is that's who she was last with. So if you were her mother, you'd want them questioned too. You would be asking some questions. So anyway, um, okay, guys. So let I'm going to just transition here a little bit to FLDS. Whew. You guys know this is a tough one. Lots of emotion wrapped up in this one. Um, you know, when you start talking about eight, nine, 10 year old little girls, it's pretty tough. And I honestly think part of my emotional uh, response to this has been that I haven't been studying this. Um, I, so many of you have been following these stories and watching these documentaries and reading these books. I hadn't. So I had my head blissfully down in the sand and so when this opportunity to find out more about this came along, it, it was all shocking to me. I mean, I, I, I think the first conversation I had, I was like, <gasps> the entire conversation, because this is stuff that I had not heard, did not know, and was just horrified by all that I knew was that there was a compound that was close to here. Um, it had come on the radar because of Serenity mis uh, disappearing. I was aware that there had been uh, a, an arrest of their prophet. Um, that's all I knew. And I just had never poked into it. And what I can say is that uh, I still haven't had a chance to watch everything and get caught up on what a lot of you guys know, but it's bad. And, uh, you know, we know that Warren Jeffs is serving a life sentence, not going to be out. Um, but, you know, to put into context a little bit, something kind of interesting has just recently happened. So we have uh, Rulon, uh, who was Warren's father, who's in the middle. And, uh, of course, you got Warren over there. Um, and then you have uh, Meryl Jessup. And uh, they're all related. Um, one thing I have found out is they're all related. Oh my goodness. When I'm at the compound, there's about a dozen of them living there. And if you dare ask the question, how are you all related? It's going to get extremely complicated because it's like, oh, that's my aunt, sisters, cousins, the, 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 the oh my goodness. So, uh, it is, they're all related to each other. Um, and so, uh, so it's okay, Shannon, that you're late. Thanks for joining. <laughs> So um, while Warren has been uh, incarcerated, Meryl has been running the show. And I don't think this is public. I have not been able to find anything anywhere about this. If I'm wrong, I Googled, I looked everywhere, um, and I was able to find out that Meryl Jessup died a week ago. 
So the man that had taken over for Warren while he was in prison has passed away. And uh, somebody that's very close to the FLDS acted like it's sort of a secretive that he's passed because he was running things. So who is Merrill Jessup? He's been acting as the leader. Um, he was convicted for con conducting a marriage of his own 12 year old daughter to Warren. And he fathered a child with a 15 year old. So this is, this guy is cut from the same cloth as Warren, but he did time in prison and then was released. So uh, evidently one week ago, I was told he passed away. So I guess part of what's interesting about that is these folks that shared this with me said, he's been running things. He's been making the decisions. This guy has been the top guy um, up until a week ago. And it's like, what is going to happen within this group with him past? Who will rise into that seat? I understand Warren is still instructing people from prison. He is still, tr but you got to have somebody that's not in prison that is running the show and uh, probably more with the day-to-day -day operations. So with Merrill gone, uh, what is going to happen is the big question that I don't think anybody knows the answer to yet. Um, but I have a theory. So in the documents and the information that I have been sharing, there is a lot of evidence pointing towards a woman leader. Hmm. You go, well, this is a very paternal society and the men ran things and the women were very subservient, but there appears from what I'm seeing to be more information lending to the fact that uh, Marilyn Steed, which would be Warren's mother and Rulon's, uh, one of his wives, has been running a lot of things and making some very important decisions. And it looks like has been for quite a while. And so uh, it looks like the one person that Warren listens to is his mother, Marilyn. Um, and so my own theory looking at this is, is that uh, with having Merrill passed away, it looks like Marilyn could be having to step into more of a front role in some ways. Um, so we'll see if I'm right about that or not. But I can tell you guys, there's a lot of evidence to show that uh, Marilyn Steed, Warren's mother, has been a very important person. I also have found a lot of documentation that she ran things with a pretty iron, a pretty iron fist and that uh, people were basically uh, very scared, intimidated of her, afraid of her because of the fact that she would act like this very holy person, but she dealt with things in a very tough way. And if you think about this, the Jeffs were considered royalty. They were considered the, the premium, the special, the chosen. So it almost sounds like it's like a queen that kind of runs things when the king's not looking, the queen takes care of business. And so um, it's it's going to be interesting to see exactly what happens with that. Um, again, if you guys did not see the video today, please watch the video. I have spent three full days down there. I'm hoping to spend another day down there, at least another day. Um, I am actually considering I have been invited to stay overnight there. Um, and spend some time actually sleeping there. I'm completely creeped out by that, <laughs> um, to be honest, uh, because there's such a bad feeling uh, of dark emptiness there and sadness. There's just a heaviness in the building. And um, sleeping there sounds kind of scary to me. Um, but I may do it just to get some more time down there and really have an opportunity to experience uh, what it was like for the people that were living there. I can tell you guys there is a lot of darkness in this building um, and buildings is what I mean. Interestingly enough, if there were a building that is the feeling of the most dark, and I had this pointed out to me, they said, do you feel that? It's within the hospital and the clinic where the babies were delivered and people were treated by a doctor. Now the FLDS had their own doctors. They actually sent people to medical school and had their own doctors. So if you went and saw a doctor, let's say for example, you were raped 
and you end up going to a doctor, if you went to their doctor, you were at their doctor. You were not at a public doctor, you were at their doctor. And so who are you going to say I was raped to? Because the doctor is their doctor. It's He's part of the upper echelon of the man. Um, when you go in the, the building that was the clinic slash hospital, your hair stands up on the back of your neck. And what's interesting about it is that the, the former member that has really opened the door to me and been so gracious and so good to me, and he's just, he's just an amazing human being, trying to do good, trying to right some wrongs. Um, he said to me, do you feel that? And it's like, I do, what is that? And he said, everybody that comes in here feels that. Where your hair stands up on your arms and your back of your neck and you just get a feeling of coldness. And I personally feel like what happened in that, in that clinic, in that hospital. Um, the other thing that is um, very interesting is the amount of drugs that are in uh, this clinic area and are actually on the compound in other areas, they had their own real pharmacy. Um, you know, I had made the assumption that due to their religion, there would not be drugs that probably they just prayed to God, you know, get rid of my headache and get rid of my cancer and all that. But actually there's medications, lots of medications, lots, boxes of medications, indicating that medicine was pretty freely handed out. And uh, I was told that uh, there is documentation, significant documentation about the fact that Warren uh, gave Prozac and things that were mood enhancers to his wives. And so I guess he felt like praying wasn't going to get it done, but a little Prozac might. So, um, you know, in this clinic, you can see that there were a lot of babies delivered there, lots of medicine given out. And I cannot also help but think that the medicine that was given out to a certain extent was part of the, the controlling of people. You know, if you keep people medicated, sedated, uh, certainly it can take people's, uh, you know, some of the energy out of them and keep them a little bit in more of a sedated state. Just like uh, Sherry, when she was talking about her, about human trafficking, one of the ways you get people to stay is you give them drugs. You give them things that they're not mentally right about. It does appear that even at the compound, that kind of stuff was going on there um, because there's lots and lots of uh, medication that still is there. So imagine their own pharmacy, their own doctors, all of that. Um, but there's definitely a heaviness in the building. I uh, have kind of wondered if there needs to be a future Ghost Hunters episode uh, because it's just a strange, a strange feeling inside the building. And uh, I don't know what you guys think about that, but it's it, it probably could be a Ghost Hunters uh, episode. Whether you believe in that or not, I just can tell you that when I'm in there, I don't feel good. And when I leave, I kind of go, whatever that is, don't follow me. Because, it, you know, certainly when evil exists in some place, it sort of hangs into the space. Um, so uh, just sort of something interesting. So I am... There's a reason, guys, that I'm being a little quiet about things. So what I have going on is that there has been some information that has come forth, that has been found, that is very significant, that has been turned over to the proper authorities. And the proper authorities are not the local authorities. Uh -uh, no. So we have some things that we have uncovered. The problem that we have is basically two things, that there's a lot of rumor and speculation. And so you have to trace things because people say, I know somebody that this, I heard this, I heard that. There's also documentation of things, but you don't know who it's referring to. So it's trying to get to the bottom of the rumors and the innuendos and trying to really find out what's real and what's not real. The other thing that is... Um, something that I want all of you to think about, I mean, really think about this, is where do you draw the line on the, the, the victim and the perpetrator? Because the truth of the matter is, whether it be Warren's mother or some of Warren's wives, there was women that were abusing and committing atrocities within this group. There's evidence to show that. Um, and 
were they the victim or were they the perpetrator? And there's something called Stockholm syndrome where you talk about the fact that people, if they're put inside an environment and in that environment, they're pressured and they're abused and they're in essence brainwashed, that they will be, they will start to think like-minded to their abusers. There's some real gray areas on some of the information that is, is coming out and that's being found where you say, boy, when you read about this, you think to yourself, how could this, how could this woman, how could these women have done this to the children, to, to their own, their own girls, their own other women's girls? How could they do that? Well, I don't know. I really, like I said, I want you guys to really think about that. It's a fine line. Are they the perpetrator or were they the victim of such a cruel environment that they were doing what they needed to survive? I'm truly on the fence. I'm truly struggling with that. And uh, I want it to be handled appropriately. I do not want to inflict further pain on people that have already been through a lot. Um, but if they hurt other people, it's it's uh, it's it's complicated. So anyway, um, I appreciate all of you. I try to always keep these at 45 minutes. I've appreciated so much, you guys, all of the amazing supportive posts I've received on my page. Lately, you guys are amazing human beings. I've had way less trolls lately. I'm probably due for a really bad one because I've had so few trolls lately. Where are they all hiding? They all hide. Um, and if you guys would please do me a favor and hit the subscribe button on my YouTube channel, I would appreciate it. It makes you so you get notified of my videos. Um, and so it really helps me. Uh, it helps with the algorithm that my videos show up when I have followers. So I appreciate if you guys just take a minute to hit the subscribe button. I am going to be bringing you guys very soon an update all about Serenity um, Denard. Uh, I have some new information and some things that I think you guys are going to go, what? You've got to be kidding me. Some of the predictions and things that were said years ago have kind of started to unfold and come true. So it's very, very interesting. Um, Jill did ask, why have you been warned to shut your mouth? So yeah, I had a very interesting uh, situation there. I'll keep it short and sweet, but there is local law enforcement that is not appreciative of what I'm doing down in Pringle. They feel that the reputation of their area is being tarnished by my videos. They're concerned about that. I feel real bad about that. Not uh, because... <laughs> There, there, that area has already had its own reputation tarnished by Warren Jeffs and the things that were going on down there. I do not believe, uh, I am not wanting to imply in any way, shape or form that law enforcement was a part of what was going on down there. I, I have not personally found any evidence to prove that. I just think that to say, please don't talk about it. You're hurting the reputation of our area and people are going to think that we're a bunch of, we were, that we weren't doing our jobs and all of those things. Well, I'm sorry that people will think that, but I'm not really responsible for what people think. Um, you know, so I, I'm going to continue to shed light on it. It's not great for me to be putting myself in this position with law enforcement. And I just have to hope that I don't get arrested for anything soon. Um, but I am hanging in there and I will just continue to expose. We just don't want to jump to any conclusions that law enforcement was a part of it. I do not have any evidence that law enforcement was a part of it. I, I want to believe that they did the best they can. But I can also tell you that there is more to come out that while it is being investigated at the proper levels, I have to keep under wraps because of the fact that the people involved, these are serious crimes. These are crimes that people could potentially do significant time for people that have not been arrested and things like that. And so I don't want to do anything to affect that and hurt that investigation. Um, so again, I'm going to be doing a serenity update soon and nothing but serenity for everybody. Appreciate you guys. I hope everybody enjoyed tonight. Um, please continue to share my stuff and have a good evening guys. See you later.